Hi, uh, and again, we'd like to welcome you to Trinity Church. And uh, this month is where we start where we, uh, we start what we call Faith Promise. Uh, I'd like to let you know missions, outreach, being a blessing to our community, it's all, always been a priority for Trinity Church. Uh, so what we do is we prayerfully and we financially support organizations, people uh, here and around the world who are making a difference for the Lord. And in and, and November, we come together and we try to share some stories and, and bring some people in that we might not, not otherwise hear from, that, of some of the people that we support, just so we can just boast and brag about what God is doing, you know, and how he uses ordinary people. And everybody that comes up, that, that's going to come up on the stage, there's nobody that's, you know, that's Superman, Superwoman, you know, they're just regular, ordinary people that God chooses to use. And they say, yes, God. And they're going to do what he wants them to do. At least they're trying to. And so our theme for this year is called unhindered faith. Now, unhindered doesn't mean perfect faith, right? We don't want you to, you know, because sometimes we hear that word unhindered, we think, well, it's got to have perfect faith. It doesn't mean that there's no fear or, or insecurity. We're all going to deal with fear, with fear and insecurity. But what it means is that we're going to try not to let those things hold us back from doing what God wants us to do. And so we're going to briefly take a look at somebody in the Bible that showed, at least in this instance, some unhindered faith. So if you have your Bibles, and if you have your Bible app, you can turn to 1 Samuel chapter 14. And if not, it should be up on the screen as well. But 1 Samuel uh, chapter 14. And while you're looking, let me set this up with what, what's going on in chapter 13. Chapter 13, if you read it, it ends with, uh, it's pretty discouraging. It's a discouraging situation. The people are scattered and they were hiding. And Saul, the king, was told that his kingship, his dynasty was going to end. And they didn't have enough weapons to fight the Philistines. So Saul and the Israelites were in a helpless and hopeless situation. There was no victory in sight. Now, if you were in that kind of situation, what kind of faith would you have? When, when troubles come your way and it feels like it's overwhelming, what kind of faith do you have? Do you have an unhindered faith? Or do you have a faith where you feel like maybe God has abandoned you? I think so many of us have struggled with that at some point. Or would you have the faith knowing that he's still working in your life. You may not see it, you may not feel it, but trust him with how good he is that he is still working in your life. So that's what we're going to pick it up in 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 1. It says, One day Jonathan, son of Saul, said to his young armor bearer, Come, let us go to the Philistine outpost on the other side. But he did not tell his father, we're going to skip to verse 4 if you're reading through your Bible. On each side of the pass that Jonathan intended to cross to reach the Philistine outpost was a cliff. Now we're going to go to verse 6. Jonathan said yet to his young armor bearer, Come, let us go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised men. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. Do all that you have in mind, as our bearer said. Go ahead. I am with you, heart and soul. So there was nothing on this day that indicated that it would be anything but a normal day. But there was something inside Jonathan that rose up. Rose up so much that he told his armor bearer, let's go to the other, the other side. Let's go to the Philistine outpost. Let's go see what's going on over there. See, every officer in the Israelite army had an armor bearer that helped them in the battle. They helped them with the administrative administration of the army. And they carried the army and the weapons of the officer. And they had to be unusually brave and loyal because they knew that the officer's life depended on them. So they had to have this great relationship. And the Israelites were in a military conflict where victory seemed impossible. They were outnumbered. But yet there was something inside Jonathan that just rose up and it made him bold enough, bold enough, 
just to see what the Lord may do. And there was no guarantee of victory. But in verse six, he says, perhaps, perhaps, perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Now, how many of you would risk your life on a perhaps? How many of you would be willing to take a chance and possibly die on a perhaps the Lord will act on your behalf? Sometimes it's challenging enough for us, if we're being honest, just to share our faith with somebody. We don't want to make them feel uncomfortable. We don't want to push our religion on somebody else. But here's Jonathan willing to act on his faith on a perhaps. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. I think Jonathan here, as we'll see, is showing some unhindered faith. See, Jonathan knew the need was great. He knew that the Israelites were hopeless, outnumbered, demoralized, and he knew that something needed to be done. You ever been in that situation where you're like, man, something needs to change. Something needs to be done. And we've, we've all felt like that about things, but are we the one that, are we willing to do something about it? And his father, King Saul, was dependent on his own power. King Saul was dependent on his own army, his own strategy. And all of that led his dad, the king, to be crippled by fear. But Jonathan knew that God wanted to use someone. And it says that his dad, the king, was sitting under a pomegranate tree. But Jonathan was willing to let God use him. See, Saul didn't seek God's will. Even he had the priest there with him who would hear from God. And, and they didn't get any instruction from the Lord. But instead, we see that God works through the heart and the faith of Jonathan who trusted him and was dependent on his leading Jonathan was willing to lean on the Lord. Jonathan knew that God wanted to work with someone. Now, Jonathan could have sat back and just prayed, right? And we should pray. We should pray about things. We should take it to the Lord because he's the one that's going to do something. But Jonathan also knew that sometimes God's going to call us to action. And he wants us to be part of the solution. And Jonathan didn't demand to know the whole, the whole battle plan from God in advance. Think about that. That's us. God, show me what you want to do, the whole thing, and then I'll move. I'll do something. Jonathan didn't ask for that. He was willing to take one step at a time and just let God work it out. That's hard to do. That's hard to do sometimes. But faith is when we know that God knows the whole plan and we're willing to know our part just one step at a time. We got to trust God knows everything, but are we still willing to just to take one step at a time? Pastor Malcolm had a really good picture of it. Your word is a lamp unto my feet, one step at a time. But we want the whole picture. Jonathan didn't need to see that because Jonathan knew the power of God. He knew God's power when he said, nothing can hinder the Lord by saving, whether by many or by few. He understood who God is. And that's where we get scared sometimes and we, our faith level drops because we take our focus off of who God is. Jonathan knew who God is. He knew that God wanted to call him to action. See, and this is wise courage because many in Israel, they probably, they, you know, like us, we believe God, man, God, you can do anything. We believe it. We believe it. But how, do we believe it enough to step out and do something? and take that chance of faith, that act of faith. 
And that's where the proof comes in the pursuit. The proof comes in, are we willing to take the chance? Because we can say we believe it all we can. But how are we going to know it? How are we going to see it if we're not willing to do something? See, Jonathan was prompted by faith. Again, he didn't, ma- he, didn't, he didn't have to know the whole plan in advance. He was willing to take one step at a time. Nothing can hinder the Lord except according to Matthew 13. Sometimes our unbelief can. There are times where God chooses not to act until we partner with him in faith and trust. Not all the time, but there are some times where that does happen. And we have to understand that it doesn't matter if it's a million to one or a thousand to one. I remember hearing somebody tell me this a long time ago. God plus you are the majority. It doesn't matter if it's a thousand to one or you know, a million to one. If it's you and God, you're going to win. You're the majority. Jonathan said it didn't matter whether it was many or few. He had little faith in himself but he had great faith in God. Amen. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) Jonathan also knew that he had a good friend. When he tells his armor bearer what he wants to do, look at his armor bearer's response. I love this. He says, do all that you have in mind. Go ahead. I am with you, heart and soul. I am with you, heart and soul. How many of you like friends that are like that? I'm with you, heart and soul. We all need friends that are like that. A friend or two that I'm with you, heart and soul. Well, hey man, you're good today. You need to come up here. When we step out in faith, encouragement can make all the difference for good and discouragement, discouragement can make all the difference for evil. See, God was going to use Jonathan, but he wasn't going to use Jonathan alone. When God works through us, he almost always calls others to help us and support us. And that's just like missions, right? God calls these people that we're going to talk to, talk about, you know, to organizations to do this for a living. But yet God calls us to help support them in some way, to help them along the way with whether it be prayerfully, financially, whatever it is, an encouraging word, God calls us to help them. He never sends somebody out by themselves. He calls other people to help their support. The people who support are just as important in getting God's work done as the person he uses. So if you've ever done anything for faith, promise, or missions, you got to understand your prayers mean the world. You know, every way you help means everything. But we all need one or two friends that have that kind of faith who will be with us no matter what, who will encourage us, who will fight with us, who will support us all for the advancement of God's kingdom where you're on the same page and, man, there's nothing like it. You're locking arm in arm and, you know, let's do this. There's nothing like it. You know, I know that it's got to feel like that when we're serving. You know, I think of, I know it's going to be mentioned today, but like the food pantry. You know, that's what they're doing out there. They're serving these committed, faithful people are serving arm in arm just to be a blessing to people who have the need. You know, there's nothing like that. So now let's continue to verse 8. It says, Jonathan said, come on then. We will cross over toward them and let them see us. If they say to us, wait there until we come to you, we will stay where we are and not go up to them. But if they say, come up to us, we will climb up because that will be our sign that the Lord has given them into our hands. You understand how difficult that is? They're low, they're, they're down low, their enemy's up high. And so if they end up having to climb up there, they're putting their weapons down, they're having to climb, that's not a good position to be in. But yet Jonathan is saying, man, if God tells us to, if they tell us to do that, we're going to take that as a sign from God that it's God. I mean, how many of you guys have ever asked God for a sign 
And maybe he gives it to you and you're still like, well, can you give me another one, God? <laughs> I heard somebody say, you know, I, I, God, I want to do it, but if you could just write it on a chalkboard for me, you know, you know, I'm with you. It says, so both of them showed themselves to the Philistine outposts and, the, and look, the Philistine said, the Hebrews are calling out of their holes they were hiding in. The men of the outpost shouted to Jonathan and his armor bearer, come up to us and we'll teach you a lesson. So Jonathan said to his armor bearer, climb up after me. The Lord has given them to the hand of Israel. So Jonathan took the support of his armor bearer as confirmation. And in his steps of faith, he really wanted to know if God was leading. You know, it's not like God gave him a specific word and said, Jonathan, I want you to go do this. If, if, if God did that and then Jonathan questioned it, that shows some unbelief, but that's not what happened. Jonathan just had this thing that rose up inside and was like, okay, let me try to use some wisdom here. He didn't act on a specific command, but he just was following this hope, this impression that he thought he should do something. And he was humble enough to know that his heart might be wrong. So he was just asking God for more leading in this. And then after all that, he had to show the faith and courage by fighting the enemy that the Lord had given them into the hand of Israel. And it was just two against many. And if we read the rest of the story, it says that they took 20 people down. See, far too often we're waiting on God when he's waiting on us. He's waiting for us to show the unhindered faith to take the first step, knowing that he is the one who knows all the steps waiting for us to trust him. And that's what I love about faith promise. It, challenge, it challenges us to think about this. You know, it challenges us to, gives us that little nudge, that conviction, a little push. You're like, man, maybe there's something God has been stirring up inside of you, God has been speaking to you about. And maybe he's like, it's time for you to take that step of faith and to trust him. And what I love about faith promise is that we get to, we get to hear from people who have said yes and who continue to say yes. Again, it doesn't mean they haven't dealt with fears or insecurities or doubts. It just means that they try not to let those things control them so that they can have this unhindered kind of faith towards the Lord to do what he wants them to do. And that's the key, because unhindered faith does not mean perfection. Remember that. And I want, I'm hoping that these stories over the next few weeks and today Use them in a way that will encourage us. Hear them in a way that will encourage us and to be challenging, not to make you feel bad, but just to push you a little bit. Or, or even to seek the Lord and God, what do you want me to do? And just listen and see what he'll do, what, he's asked, what he'll ask you to. So with all that being said, that's kind of the overall theme that we're going through the faith promise this year. So we have a, a couple that's going to come to the stage um, that works for an organization called 180 Lodi. Uh, since 2002, um, you know, the 180 has been dedicated to the restoration of the city uh, through 180 turns towards teens, families, thriving physically, emotionally, and spiritually. They do that in a variety of ways. So you guys, um, some of you guys know them, some of you guys don't, but this is Cameron and Tawny Davis. You guys want to come up, give them a hand. <laughs> Aren't they such a good-looking couple? Yeah. <laughs> so many trials, so many insecurities, so many things, but it does not stand in his way. Yes. Good morning, Trinity Church. Good morning. Uh, we are Tawny and Cameron Davis. Uh, in 2011, we became part of the Trinity family here just after we got married. Um, and within that time, those five years that we spent working with families, and staff, we became so much part of the fabric of this community um, that we still to this day draw from the wisdom that we had gathered, um, from the trials and the things that you as a community have gone through. We went through those with you and we have still, uh, we are still pulling from those and they are such a blessing to us. Um, this is the place um, that our family began its journey aligning itself 
with the kingdom of God for the here and now, not just for the future. So now our family is five people strong and living as missionaries in our hometown of Lodi. In 2015, our family was one of the last to launch from a cohort of about five interns on staff at Trinity. We returned back to Lodi with a vision for leading the youth of our city and a passion for seeing our hometown come to worship the Lord. Um, Cameron went on staff with Vinewood Community Church as a youth and worship pastor. And I was at home with um, a one and a half year old and a almost born. And as time progressed at that church, we started to realize that there was this churning inside of us that when we would visit Lodi Lake or I would go to play dates with other moms or I would just walk around the city that there were these groups of people that weren't represented within the church that we were working at. So unbeknownst to Cameron, I would load up all the kids and I would go get a coffee and I would start driving around the city. And I started to realize that as soon as I crossed over the railroad tracks into um, the east side of Lodi, that my heart just came alive. And I realized like, this is where I wanna be. And to many, it represents a lot of chaos within Lodi. It's known for gang rivalries. It's known for drug use. Um, it's known for being kind of an underserved area in Lodi. So there's not a ton of resources within the east side. Well, in November of 2020, I went to a business meeting for a board that I had come on to. And during that business meeting for 180, they turned to me and they said, you know, one of the things on the agenda tonight is that we need a family to move to the east side of Lodi into this house we just bought. And the timing was not good. I turned to Allison McGregor, the executive director, and I said, it's not the Davis family. Because it was 2020, we had just survived COVID. I had just finished a business degree that I was really set on using in the workforce. And we had a six-year-old, a five-year-old, and a one-year-old at the time. And it didn't seem like the time to take that step and move to the east side, even though my heart was for it in the future. Well, it took God a whole 18 hours later. And I woke up and I said, Cameron, we have to call them right now and tell them that we're going to do this because I might back down if we don't do it right now. And he was that armor bearer. And he said, I'll be with you if you decide this. <laughs> but I know your heart's in it. And so his heart eventually changed. And he was really excited about it. And we said yes that day to moving to the east side. So we sold our house that we had just bought and moved into only about a year and a half prior. And we went and we were in our new house within a month. And so this month is actually four years that we are honored to celebrate of being on the east side of Lodi. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so a little bit about the 180. Uh, in 2002, as Ernie was sharing, um, a local church started 180 programs for the sake of having a place for teens to just come and hang out after school. Um, we believe that God's kingdom is not just for when we die, like I said, but it is for um, the here and now. God's kingdom is free from the brokenness that we see, and though sin still presses in on us from all sides, um, it does not stand in his way. Amen? We believe that the church should be active alongside God as he breaks harmful family cycles and alleviates oppression and injustice that threatens the hope that we see, the hope that is in and we see within the people that we do life with. Um, what started in 2002 as an alternative place, like I said, has now grown to an independent nonprofit um, of 40 plus staff members uh, with four different branches or five up there five different branches. Um, the first to plant was the Teen Center, which now provides mentoring after school activities, Wednesday night dinners and Bible teachings. And it stays open late on Friday nights so kids actually have a place to come and be that is safe. Uh, the second thing to develop out of the need for a growing mental health crisis or the awareness of that um, was individual family group counseling, uh, professional school-based mental health services and now over 27 different schools in four different school districts in our area. Uh, the third to develop was the community branch, which we are most closely tied with, and I co-direct with another friend of ours that we went to high school with. 
um, which presses into the community development piece of our neighborhood, uh, ha develops after school programs and lunchtime sports on campuses, which is where the highest rate of suspensions happen is at lunchtime. Go figure, right? Um, the majority of that team does live on the east side of town to really advocate and be a part of the fabric of what's going on. Um, as a way of getting kids into the outdoors, which has its own set of challenges, we developed the Adventures program, which takes kids to four different locations throughout the year, every year the same spots, and challenges them with different things like high ropes courses, backpacking, camping, or just living in tents, which is new for some kids. Some kids have never seen the ocean and have never seen the snow. That's the thing, didn't know that. Um, and then lastly, the glue that holds it all together, we planted Kingdom Community, which is a church um, that was established so that our staff and the community we do life with can come together and just simply worship. Our work becomes so integrated into the lives of those that we serve that the gospel message is not just preached, but it's lived out alongside and it becomes conversational. Um, this is a picture that was taken at an annual fundraiser, or our annual fundraiser this last year. Uh, families and nonprofits and other organizations in the city come together to celebrate what God has done, and then we present the things that God is doing. And I'll share our big thing that we're going to be pushing in the next year uh, with you in just a moment. Sorry. So you can go to the next slide now with the baptisms. So as we began our ministry, um, we realized that in our neck of the woods of the Heritage District, there is no local park for the kids to play in. There's no safe place for these families to come and be a community um, other than front porches, which we're great at on the east side. And we all sit out at night on our front porch or our lawn. Um, but we realized that our backyard that at the time was a huge mud pit with nothing in it and mattresses were the back fence. Um, there was razor wire all over the place. It had become an encampment because it was abandoned for so long. So as we found bullets and all kinds of things in our dirt, um, we realized we don't have the means to have a community center and plant that right now, though that's a dream someday. So we're just gonna make it in our backyard. And it was the tail end of COVID and I had three kids at home. So it was also a little bit of like, I just need to survive and I can't have all these people inside my actual house all the time. Um, so we rolled out some sod. Our neighbors joined and helped us wheelbarrow it all in. Um, they helped us with every step of the process. So it became just as much their project as it was ours. By the end, we had fresh lawns and gravel and um, places for picnic tables and a garden. We also quickly put in a playground. Um, and that very spot became the place that our boys were able to be baptized this last summer. So when we looked around, it was very sweet. We actually moved the playground and put a little pool in for it. Um, it was so sweet to look around and see that the 10 years of relationships of being back in Lodi and the four years in this neighborhood um, had culminated into this moment where we had people from various schools our kids had gone to. We had people from the prior church, but we also had neighbors and people who have long histories and traumas with the church who were coming to watch this baptism take place. And to hear our kids in front of everyone give their sweet testimonies and what it meant to follow the Lord was just a really kingdom moment in that backyard. So we all shared a meal afterwards and um, it was a very sweet time to reflect back on the journey God's brought us since leaving Trinity. So some of you heard last year that we were in the process of purchasing a home uh, in a neighboring area called Woodbridge, which is actually where I grew up. Um, all of those plans fell through completely. And um, that's okay, because about a year later, um, God opened up the doors to this location here on Locuston Central, um, which if there was a corner of the east side of town that represented so much of what weighs down our neighborhood, this is it. Um, pretty unique placement. Um, the front uh, fence that you can see right here literally looks into the intersection where so much happens. And it has now become um, the home that we have purchased just as of a month ago or a few weeks ago. Closed two weeks ago. Yeah. Two weeks ago. Um, the hope for this and the plan for this um, is that it becomes 
um, the place where we develop missional living. So we have had interest from across the nation of people wanting to come and stay. And as we're still developing, we're like, hold on just a second, we got to figure this out. Um, but the idea is that people can come and learn missional living in this spot. It's a duplex, so there's a top and a bottom residence. Um, and what better place to put it than on the corner of one of the harder spots in our neighborhood, right? Um, while the plans of this project are just beginning, we know that God has specifically designated this spot, and we just had to wait a little bit longer, and so it's wonderful. Um, we believe that God is wildly and strategically going to war with the things. You can go to the next slide if you want. These are just a few of our statistics, if you're interested. Um, going to war with the things that keep us from seeing him more fully. And we believe that he uses um, his people, the church, to stake kingdom claim over the physical locations where darkness once stood. So on behalf of all of those that we serve and our family and our staff, we are very thankful for your prayers and your support. It means the world to us, uh, especially when things get very hard and very difficult. So thank you, Trinity family, for your time. All right, thank you guys uh, very, very much. You know, they have the opportunity to chat with them after, afterwards. Uh, I have a brief window here, though, that I want to answer basically two questions, especially for those who are newer. The first is, what is faith promise? We're obviously talking about uh, lots of folks that we're supporting both locally, and uh, you're going to hear more uh, abroad. Um, but beyond that, Faith Promise is an opportunity to let those know who have invested in this work. Remember a few weeks ago, uh, a couple weeks ago, we talked at the very end of 1 Corinthians, there is a collection so they could help the church back in Jerusalem. The other thing that Paul took up a collection for was to support his work and those other folks that were sharing the good news um, across uh, the, region, the region. We've kind of brought those two together, helping our brothers and sisters in Christ, as well as preaching the, the uh, good news. And uh, we give you a report on that and then give you an opportunity to invest. So here's the best example I can give, at least for, uh, with a Silicon Valley bent, okay? Many of you are familiar with, and hopefully you actually have, something to the degree of a mutual fund. So here's a napkin explanation of a mutual fund, all right? What happens is this, is that you have a job, and Lord willing, either through your work or yourself on your own, you take a little money out of each paycheck, and it's probably a very little amount of money, and uh, you pull it together with other people. So someone over here may have the same mutual fund as someone over here who has the same mutual fund from over here. And then somebody whose job it is <laughs> to deal with a growing market, uh, they take all that money, they collect together, it's pulled together, right, into a mutual fund. It's mutual because we all mutually fund it. And then they invest that money in stocks, bonds, and money market, okay? The simplest explanation I give is they buy a, hopefully a little bit of some huge company. Hopefully that company grows. And so your initial investment, I'm going to use a good round number of $100. And whether it grows with inflation, 3%, or whether it, it grows because they just hit on something great and grows 10%, right? Then all the investors get their money back, hopefully with a little bit more, $3 more, $10 more. So $100 is now $110, right? And that, that's the whole idea of a mutual fund where you can take your little, give it, uh, uh, have somebody manage it that's a little bit smarter about the market than you, right? That also, quite frankly, these companies wouldn't be interested in my paltry sum of money, but when I combine it with uh, thousands of other people, it looks like a lot of money. And they're like, yeah, we'll take that, right? We'll deal with that. And then you see your, your, your money kind of grow exponentially in ways that you wouldn't if you just yourself tried to invest that little bit of money. So faith promise is the same thing, except it takes a financial return. And instead, there's a spiritual return, okay? So here's my summary paragraph. Sorry, it's not your notes. So you, you can take a picture of it if you're curious about it. So when you invest in faith promise, you're pooling your money along with other followers of Jesus, folks here from Trinity Church, and, and actually in a lot of cases, a lot of other churches as well. You are investing in projects that advance the gospel. That's the good news of Jesus, which stores up according to the Bible, 
treasures in heaven. It's, it's a spiritual investment. The more believers that invest, the more opportunity there is for the gospel to be shared and for people all over the world to come to faith in Christ. For instance, we have a normal level that we, that we were at. And remember last year, for those of you here, we kind of challenged you and said, hey, if we get above and beyond, we're going to invest in some other projects. Project 180 was one of those projects. The only reason that we are part of that, at least at the degree we are, is because folks by faith gave a little bit more, and so the opportunity for the gospel to advance grew a little bit more. Are you following me? This means yes. This means you follow me? Okay, so here's the second question then. How do I get involved? How do I get involved? It's a three-step process. Number one, it all comes from the, uh, the a card, the faith promise card which we're not going to ask you today. There's not this hard sell today. Turn this in. Okay, I believe it's in the seat pocket in front of you, right, Ernie? I don't know where Ernie is. Yes? Yep. And so you can, you can grab that and pray, but we're not asking you to turn it in today because of the first step. Notice the first thing on the card. Pray and ask the Lord what he wants you to, what you, wants you to do. This is going to be different for everyone. Remember, again, a couple weeks ago, uh, when Paul was coming through, he was saying, I want everyone to give, but he said, according to what? According to how you've been blessed, according to what God has given you. For some of you, it may, it may be for you a big deal, but, but monetarily it may not be. For others uh, of you, it may be a, a, a larger number that God has put you on your heart. For some of you, right, God's going to give you like, hey, you have X amount of dollars that you spend on pizza a month or whatnot. I want you to give that. Others of you, God's going to say, I want you to give you, he's going to give you a number and you're like, I don't have that. And he's going to go, yeah, Jonathan wasn't able to defeat the army either. I want you to step out like that. It's going to be different for everyone. That's why you need to pray. Because we're not here to tell you what you need to give. We're not even here to tell you that you should give. I mean, as a pastor, I would say it's a biblical principle you should. But, but um, it's not like I keep this list and I'm going to look at you different the following Sunday. All right? There's no list like that. Uh, um, this is between you and the Lord. Now, we do keep track so we know what to commit. Project 180 and some other projects that you're gonna that you're gonna hear about, but pray about it and listen to the Holy Spirit. Don't listen to us. Don't listen to the outside voices. Don't listen to your investment port portfolio. Don't even listen to reason. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Listen to the Holy Spirit and do what He shows you to do, whether it's little or much. God, by the way, is gonna do something major either way. Um, that's the whole thing. Right? That's, Jonathan actually didn't know that God wanted him to act. He knew that God wanted to save, and he said basically, all right, I'm ready to act, God, if you want me to. And then God said, yep, I want you to. And then he acted accordingly. We want you to do the very same thing. The second thing is support the mission by giving financially. That's that second box. And again, it's going to be different for everyone. We're going to pull whatever's left. Uh, I'm not whatever's left, but whatever people say that they're going to give, we're going to let our folks know that we support Currently, we're going to say, guess what? We get to con continue to support you, maybe a little bit more. And then we're going to consider new projects, all that you will hear about um, in the future. It does matter us that everyone participates. Not It's, it's so much. We, we do keep track of, hey, you know what? We have X amount of households here. How do we do? And that really is a more of a test for us than for you is how well our folks are responding by faith to what God is, is doing. But the dollar amount is whatever the dollar amount is. Kind of, a, kind of a deal. And then lastly, this is a huge uh, request that we get from missionaries. Actually, more than financial help, they ask for us to pray for them. And so uh, you're going to be getting a, a, uh, a booklet here that has our missionaries and uh, some basic information about them. We would love for folks <clears throat> to diligently grab that booklet and pray for our missionaries throughout the year. Because of the kind of situations that they're in, all the money in the world will not change hearts. It will not. Only the power of the Holy Spirit, the same power that we're asking God to lead us in, will change, will change hearts. And it, and it takes prayer more than anything in order uh, um, for strongholds to be torn down and lives to be restored. Another example of that is one of our key, key partners, uh, city teams. And so we've invited Hermie to come and share all the wonderful things that we partner with them on. Thank you, Pastor Joel. Good morning, good morning. Uh, Pastor Ernie and Pastor Joel, thank you so much for inviting me to share. And uh, 
Yeah, I just want to share a little bit about our partnership and give you some, um, you know, a, a little bit, some stats and some results, what we uh, are doing, and share some opportunities and some a few things that's to come and what we are trusting the Lord, how the Lord's going to use our partnership here in Sunnyvale. Um, and if you're not familiar with City Team, City Team is a uh, local nonprofit Christian organization. We started it back in 1957, and currently we have seven distinct different um, um, ministries and focuses. And uh, we are known, uh, you know, it started us as helping the homeless and providing meals and providing shelter. And we also help men and women overcome substance abuse. We provide shelter, but we also provide some transitional housing for, uh, for men and also women and children, either escaping domestic violence or homelessness. Uh, we provide uh, temporary housing also for women that are pregnant. Uh, but I'm the director of City Team in the Neighborhood, and we help low-income families. And uh, our mission statement at City Team is to show and share Christ's unconditional and redemptive love by caring for people's immediate needs. That's Matthew 25. You know, when we love on the least of these, Jesus says we serve him, we love himself, uh, uh, we are loving Jesus, but also enable lasting solutions. And that's really where... Matthew 28, the Great Commission comes in. So we believe those two really goes hand in hand. We have at City Team in the Neighborhood, we have these four distinct uh, programs. Um, we partner with the local food banks and second office of Silicon Valley. They are the world champions at getting staggering amounts of food. And then we take that, that food that they deliver, we take that to um, communities where people live, learn, or play. And we serve them where, when it's convenient to them. We have 62 different mobile pantries, and one right here at the, with, uh, in partnership with, uh, with you all at the Gateway Neighborhood Center. Um, and, um, but that's just the beginning. Then we do these pop-up clothing closets where it's a little bit more intimate, a little slower down, and that's where we share testimonies. That's where we build rela deeper relationships. That's where we also get to pray for people and we create on-ramps to lasting solutions. And it starts by people giving them an opportunity to say yes to Jesus, where they can discover God, they can get in the word for themselves. And many people, they maybe know of God, but they never read his word. And with loneliness being such a huge issue, people are isolated and they're overwhelmed. And when they get to know God, in context of, of, of Christian community, that is so transformational. It addresses a lot of the, the root causes and the problems. And then the final thing is, is career connections. We want to long, come alongside people and help them discover, take them through a process where they can discover how God has wired them, what, how does that translate to a job that's going to provide them a living wage, and provide them with the support and the coaching and the mentoring to actually go from where they are to that. Some other skills like financial literacy and those things also come to play, but really lifting families and eventually multiply that, we can lift whole communities out of poverty. Not just financial poverty, but spiritual poverty and relational poverty. So, um, our partnership with Trinity, uh, it starts with our pantry. Can you start the next slide, please? In the last fiscal year of September to August, you guys have served... 3,531 families. Those are the times that you guys have served the family. Not only that, they took that food home and they were able to cook 117,000 meals. And the, the dollar value of that is $271,000. That money that they can now spend, not at the grocery store, but they can, they can put gas in their car, they can pay for the, some of the other bills and reinvest it in the family. And with the help of 40 different volunteers. Um, many of you, if you have volunteered in the last uh, 12 months, can you please stand up? And if you have volunteered at the pantry? Just look around. Thank you, thank you, thank you so, so much. You know, you guys, and we also have um, some people that just sign up. You guys have created volunteer opportunities for the community. That's almost 800 hours that was tracked on our, on our Volunteer Hub uh, platform. Um, Pastor Ernie has told me, you know, Jan and the team, they need some more help. Uh, so please, this is one thing that you can, that you can sign up. And you don't have the long-term commitment. Just come out and, and, and check it out every second and fourth Saturday. We run the pantry from, uh, from 10 to 12. Um, 
show up a little before to help with kind of like the setup, but it's not a long-term commitment, so please come and check that out. And if you're interested, you, there's some great fellowship too. Absolutely. It's not just what we do, it's who we do it with. Um, so, yeah, check that out. Now, the next slide is, like I said, this is one of 62. Those are all the different uh, pantries scattered all over um, Santa Clara, San Mateo, and, and Alameda County. The only reason we can do this is because we partner with 50 local churches. We want to make it super easy for the local church to do what God has called them to do, and that's love on their neighbors. You don't need the transportation, you know, cold storage and all. We'll take care of all of that. Just host and love on your low-income neighbors. And then through the pop-up closets, we create on-ramps then and invite people to Vital Connections. Vital Connections is a, um, and you can show the next slide, it takes six months. It's an introduction to the Bible. It's an introduction to God. And has these four components, connecting with God, connecting with self, your family, and connecting with your community. Community meaning your neighbors, but also spiritual community. And we see great results from this program. And we try to minimize the barriers for people that are not, that are hesitant to come to church, uh, hesitant to even read the Bible. So it's, it's, it's really meet them where they're at and, and help them along. And this photo was taken, um, I believe, on Friday at the Vala Connections group that started here um, with, uh, with the help of, of a city team employee. And some of you know Armadeni and, and, and Kiara. And uh, we believe that's going to be the birth of a team that's going to be, bring a lot of transformation. I want to share this quick Vital Connection testimony. That's Lisbeth. Lisbeth is the lady there in the middle. Um, she, her story is too common, unfortunately, that, that I hear a lot. She was struggling with loneliness and depression. She had a miscarriage. And for seven years, she was just, um, she said she would cry every day. She didn't want to live anymore. Put a lot of strain on her, on her, on, on her marriage. And, um, and they were struggling. So she started going to our, our Mayfair pantry, and there she got invited to a pop-up. At the pop-up, she got invited to Vital Connections. And when she learned what Vital Connections is, she says, you know what, that's what I need. I'm going to take a step out of faith and join this group. She says at the second meeting, these people just welcomed her, and they just loved her, and she just felt, wow, she just felt God's presence there. At the second meeting, God lifted her depression. And God started a transforming life and a healing life in her life that is incredible. Her husband saw the transformation and also her sister and mom who also joined Vital Connections. Next slide. Then when she graduated, she had her sister and her mom there. And they, they had a strained relationship with her mom. But now they are serving together, loving together. And God has really restored her family. Next slide. They all got baptized uh, about five weeks ago. And her husband also there at the baptism ceremony gave his life to Christ and committed he wants to get baptized. And he's also joining a Vital Connections program. And, I, uh, and he said, you know what? He said, what I love is I saw my wife not only get healed from depression, but he, she found her purpose. And when I asked her, what's your purpose, Lisbeth? She said, my purpose is to multiply in others. I want as many people as possible to have the same opportunity I have. Therefore, she volunteers at the, at the, at the pop-up closet, and she says, I love to register. And when I register people, I share with them my testimony. I share with them also, it's not just the clothing. We can help you. God can, can, can do amazing things. What he did for me, he can do for you. So we already have the pantry. You guys are serving, on average, about 160 families every second and fourth Saturday. We already provided Trinity with the racks and everything. We have the clothing. We would love to kickstart the pop-up closet again. We need people. We need a team. Now, just like Pastor Ernie said, you know, this is, uh, it's going to take a step of faith. But we need people with different skills and abilities. Some of you, if you just have the ability to create hospitality, we got a, we got a role for you. If you like to connect with people and find those least bits, because perhaps... There are, I know that there are several people right now that are ready to say yes. Every time we give an invitation at our pop-ups, 25% or more say yes. 25%. The harvest is so ready right now. So we just need some people that are willing to host. We got the space here. We got plenty of space to host them. And, um, and, and, and then also prayer support. Some of you... 
you may not be able to serve there, but we need at least 12 or more people that will intercede and share and, 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 and pray that you would give us favor to find these people to say yes. And then once they say yes, we know that persecution happens, that God will really reveal himself to them. Another volunteer opportunity, so if you go down there, give help and get help on, on, on get help, get familiar with the services, please refer, we want to be a resource to you. Um, and also on the, on, on the give help, we need some volunteer help. So you could go down and you will see volunteer. When you click on that next slide, I want to highlight spiritual mentors. And I believe some of you already are serving as spiritual mentors to our men and women in our, in our uh, residential programs. But our goal is that every man has another man outside that becomes a godly friend that meets with him once a, uh, once a week and just journey along with him. The same with women. We need about 28 spiritual mentors for our women's programs, and I believe it's about 14 on the men. And you would get a front row seat to see what God is doing in somebody's life. Even if you've never discipled the mentor, someone will train you, will match you up with someone. And I, I know you will not regret this. So please check that out. And um, I just want to thank you all for parting with us. We cannot do this without your support. And everybody that is um, so faithfully serving, um, thank you, thank you, thank you. We know that God is going to do some great things. And uh, I'll be at the lobby at, uh, at the end of the service. So if you have any questions, come and see me. Thank you. Jen. Once again, thank you so much to Harmony from City Team. Thank you, uh, Cameron and Tani from uh, 180 Lodi. Um, we have these booklets that are outside on, on the tables. You guys are welcome to take it. Um, and they talk about all of our, the people that we support. Gives you a little bit of information about them, websites, stuff like that. And uh, it's a really amazing looking book. Um, I did this all myself. <laughs> Actually, I paid somebody to do it, but it's okay. But, uh, but still, you know, we're not going to be able to get to everybody in this booklet over the next few weeks, but we're trying to get through as much as we can. Some will be live, some will just be informational. But if you want more information, just grab one of these, you know, per your family. They're free uh, to take with you. And then um, we also um, have a couple of gifts for you. We have some little, uh, little stress balls. Say Trinity Church Faith Promise 2025. So, you know, I don't know if anybody want to play some catch. I'll give you the catch right here. Oh, sorry, I'm in the <laughs> wrong person. Mary, here you go. A couple of, oh, you blocked yours. I'll throw it farther. <laughs> throw it in the back there. Oh, popping somebody in the head over here. All right, we got some more. And, hey, Dodgers won, baby. Dodgers won. <laughs> and one back there. <laughs> All right. Um, and, and just remember that, you know, with Jonathan, the story going back to Jonathan, you know, he didn't know that if God was going to act or not, right? He was like living on, taking a faith a step on that perhaps. He knew God. He knew God is. He knew that what God can do. But, you know, he still had to take that step of faith. And that's what we're just encouraging everybody. You know, what is God speaking to you about? What does he want you to do? You know, what is he asking you to do? And to be able to take that step of faith and just watch God be God and watch him work in your life. Uh, but, but you guys have a great rest of the week. And I also know that we have food out here for you, of course. Uh, Leo's prepared a feast once again. I believe there's salmon and, and pork chops and all the sides. You guys are welcome to stay. It's uh, free for everybody and, and everybody. And, and uh, we'd love to see you hang out and so we can just talk with you and, and you know, talk with Hermie a little bit and Cameron and Tanya as well. Um, ask them as many questions as you guys can. But God bless you guys. You guys have a good week.